Hi, I'm Judith Dreyer. Thank you for joining me for this podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. My intent is to take us, you and I, into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties directly to the holistic nature of the world around us. How can we connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature's in us? I will be featuring authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth helps us create bridges. We'll see what's trending, what's relevant to our world today, not just for land use, but to connect the dots between ourselves and nature. It's time for practical action and profound inner change so our natural world is valued once again. And today, I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Ashley Berkman, who is a naturopathic physician at the Collaborative Natural Health Partners and has been part of this team for over six years now here in Connecticut. Her favorite part of working with this team is the strength there is in collaborating on patient care. Uh, while she treats a variety of health conditions, her particular interests are in endocrinology, gastroenterology, and autoimmune diseases. Today, uh, I have invited Dr. Berkman here to talk about our gut biome, our gut health, and our immune system because we're approaching the holidays, and it's a great time to support our physical body while we're having fun with our family and friends. So welcome, Dr. Berkman. Thank you for having me, Judith. I'm really excited to be here. Great. Um, tell us something about your journey into naturopathic health and perhaps a little bit about the focus of naturopathic care, just so we understand the differences between naturopathic care and Western medicine. Yeah, so um, I always like to speak to my brand new patients about what naturopaths are, even if they're like, yep, I've been to a naturopath, I know what it is. I like to just give them a nice little background because I think um, naturopaths, really we try to find the root of why something is happening. So instead of just putting Band-Aids on it and suppressing symptoms, we're always looking to find why is it happening and what can we do to correct that permanently so we don't have to worry about it anymore. So, um, for example, a patient may come in, uh, I may have 10 patients in a day that come in for headache complaints, and they may all walk out with completely different looking treatment plans. Um, one might be because they're a bit dehydrated, they're getting headaches. One might be because they're eating foods that might not be serving them. One could be stress, insomnia, you know, a nutrient deficiency, a hormone imbalance. And so we are all so very unique that... Um, there isn't really an algorithm that you can follow that will say, hey, you know, someone with a headache, you give them this medication. If that doesn't work, you give them this medication, and then you give them this one. We really have to listen to the patient's whole health history to kind of understand what's going to help them the most. Um, so I like to give people those kind of examples so they understand why I, they may have come in for jaw pain, but I'm asking them about their bowel habits. I'm asking them about how many antibiotics have you had in your history? Um, you know, what was your mom's health like when she was, you know, um, pregnant with you? And these are all things that sometimes people are like, why, why do you need to know all this stuff? And I'm like, well, it's, it is very important for me to know to help direct maybe why you're experiencing the symptoms that you're having. So, um, I think it makes it fun to be a nature path because there's so many options, but it can also be um, difficult, too, because it's very hard to find the crux for the person. So um, I think that's why I like working in a team, because um, we have so many other practitioners in our office that went to different um, universities across the country. So we get to kind of pull on each other's strengths that way um, whenever you feel like you get stuck, because the second you feel stuck, you ask the team and there's like 700 other ways and you're like, oh yeah, okay, there we go. That's that's the beauty of it. So there's always an option. There's always something else to try. And so that's what I really enjoy about it. Great. I like the idea that it's sort of not one size fits all, but rather more individual because we are individual in how we present the same symptom. And as you <laughs> mentioned, our we have a, a mind, we have emotions, we have a spiritual nature, and we have a physical body, and we all interact and interface and interplay on that kind of bigger spectrum um, that makes us unique uh, in a way. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, since we're getting into the holidays now, 
I know that a lot of folks get either more stress, uh, we also have more parties, we also do the kind of eating that perhaps we don't usually do, very easy to be tempted. And I'd like to know more about the role our gut plays in all of this, especially with our immune system. Yeah, so our immune system is made up of a matrix of cells that orchestrate together to prevent illness or to fight off illness um, when we do succumb to something. And becoming ill is normal. I mean, we can expect to get sick every once in a while, but there's definitely things we can do to prevent that from happening um, so frequently. So the immune system does not work alone. It really takes cues from everything else going on in your body. So just as you had said, around the holidays, we usually eat differently. We probably don't sleep as much as we should. We don't, um, you know, we're probably a little more stressed, um, you know, around the holiday time financially or just emotionally. Um, and we're probably not exercising or doing the things that we normally would do. So your immune system says, hey, like something's different. We don't, we don't normally live like this. We don't normally consume this much alcohol. Um, and that can stress the body out. So your immune system hears that noise from the adrenal system, the stress system, and will say, you know, we need to kick it up a notch. We need to work a little harder because clearly we're under stress. We're running from some sort of bear, so let's let's deal with that. So when that occurs, your immune system can get kind of tired. Um, it can get kind of tired of doing that, and it can only do it for so long before it starts to weaken. So you know, the classic picture of a student who's going through um, midterms or finals and they burn the candle at both ends, they don't sleep, they don't, they pretty much just caffeinate and don't eat well. They might get through finals, but they come home from school and they're sick for two weeks. So your immune system is like, this is really what we've been trying to help you to get through, but we really shouldn't have been doing that this whole time. So, um, if we really aren't taking care of our body in that way, we're going to find that we're going to start to fall ill more. So um, specifically how that relates to to um, the digestive system is that um, there's this uh, nerve that connects our brain to our digestive system called the vagus nerve. And when our body is under stress, the brain will tell the digestive system we're under stress, but the digestive system will also tell the brain that we're under stress if we're eating inappropriately, having some inflammation in that digestive system. So um, we really want to make sure that we are taking care of that ecosystem in our digestive tract in order to maintain a healthy immune system. So that's kind of how, how they interplay with one another. Um, but I think, you know, maintaining good health habits um, trying not to veer too far from what you normally do, if that's healthy, um, is the best thing you can do to prevent that immune system from getting overworked. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go into the digestive tract in particular, because I'm fascinated by the gut biome. In the gardening world, we're very, very concerned about the health of our soil. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of amendments. There's a lot of things we can do to create better soil, even after we get through harvesting. How does that relate in our digestive tract with the foods that we eat or the substances that we drink? How does that affect our the, the health of our, our gut biome in a, in a way that relates to the soil biome? So what's interesting is they find like um, gardeners in particular usually have a more robust, healthy microbiome just because they're in the soil, you know, and usually then you're eating the plants from the soil, which is um, an added bonus. So, I mean, we're meant to live in this like symbiotic relationship with all of these bacteria and organisms in our environment. And so, yeah, there's a few of them that can make us ill, like strep pneumonia or, you know, strep throat and things like that. But normally, like over 90% of our actual cells on our body are not us. We're actually made up of healthy symbiotic bacteria, viruses, and fungus. So it it's kind of mind-blowing to think that that is really the case, but really what it means is we need to really be a healthy host for these guys. Like, we don't want to, you know, be inflamed and scare them off, the good, healthy bacteria and things that actually help us versus um, when we do eat in a more inflammatory way, meaning more sugar, more dehydrating beverages, like over caffeinating and over um, consuming alcohol, those things all lead to an ecosystem 
that's not going to be as um, symbiotic or healthy for us. So it's all going to take a key, everything in the digestive tract, the bugs are going to live depending on what we eat and what we do. Medications um, play a big role in this as well. Um, people who are on long-term anti-acid medications or um, proton pump inhibitors for reflux disease um, have a different ecosystem, different microbiome makeup than people who aren't. Um, people who have been exposed to copious amounts of antibiotics have a different ecosystem than those who don't. Um, those who eat animal meats and those who don't. Those who eat plants and those who don't. So um, it's really interesting the whole how the whole balance of the microbiome can be shifted by little things. And really recently they've been doing a lot of research on how stress can affect that too. Mm -hmm. So um, stress, of course, from food, but just psychological stress and not allowing our body to decompress um, will change that microbiome into more inflammatory um, type of uh, microbiome, which is not going to bode well for us um, or our immune system. No, it won't, because the more we inflammation that we have, doesn't that, that opens the door to different diseases, correct? Definitely. So it's been speculated that um, we have more um, asthma and allergies and eczema, what we call atopy, um, in individuals who especially start out their life maybe not being born vaginally, being born cesarean, um, maybe not being breastfed, and then um, introducing food that um, is not appropriate before the age of six months, especially before the age of two years. So um, we find that, well, those are all reactions from the immune system. You're reacting to the environment with allergies um, or your skin might be reacting. Um, we also have a major burden in this country of an increase in autoimmune conditions, mm -hmm. meaning our immune system glitches and starts to attack us. So it can do that in our joints, it can do that to our nerves, it can do that to our organs. Um, and again, we really want to hone in on not just, I mean, of course, suppressing the process. We have to stop the immediate reaction. But what is driving that? Like, if we can change someone's ecosystem in their digestive tract, they are showing that there's better outcomes, maybe even synergistically with medication or even without um, for managing some of those chronic illnesses. So um, it's pretty incredible how that my, I have a professor who lovingly called it the, the hole in the middle. Our whole digestive system is interlinked with everything. Like you talk about mental, emotional health, you talk about joint pain or anything. You really need to address that um, ecosystem because if it's not working for us, it's going to work against us, and that's not what we want. No, it isn't. I, I know in my world of wild edibles, one of the things I found very fascinating is that the herbs that are considered nervines happen to have an effect on the digestion. So if we can calm the emotional part of us, it affects our digestion. And then I found those herbs that seem to be more um, recommended for digestion happen to have an effect on the nervous system and it calms our emotional state so they they have an interplay with each other which is fascinating to me uh, that the digestive system and our emotions have such an interrelationship too and that comes up at the holidays you know we get tired we want to meet expectations for family and friends we rush here we rush there um, and so our emotions play into it as well and that I'm assuming from your point of view with the, the gut biome that affects what we are how our body's responding is what I'm trying to get at yeah, definitely. And it is an interesting um, piece that when you, yeah, you give a nervine that's going to calm the mind, it'll calm down someone's digestive system. It's classic. There's a couple of herbs I really like that are great for um, irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, which is really common, um, which is often um, a sign of stress on the body, anxiety. Somebody's going to manifest um, more cramping and increased bowel movements or just bloating and digestive trouble. Um, there's a combination called genshen and skullcap that um, classically you think of for calming the mind, which it does. Um, it's great for the nervous system, but it's in a formula specific for IBS. And so you take that before your meal so that your body is kind of purposefully switched into this rest and digest mode. Mm -hmm. So it's not in fight and flight mode, even if you know, we're all guilty of it eating in the car or we're trying to eat while we're multitasking, doing work. 
your brain is saying, we can't eat right now, we're not digesting, we're focusing on the task at hand. But this, by doing something like that, taking a Nervine or something that's going to calm the, the emotional state, will say, hey, let's shunt some blood flow and let's focus on breaking this food down. And it's kind of incredible how well that can work, just that alone. I mean, of course, changing people's behavior, teaching them to be mindful, taking a step to just take a couple breaths before you go ahead and eat your food. Um, but herbs can really be powerful in that way and can really make a big difference in your digestion. <laughs> So so if the herbs have that kind of an effect and you find them effective, what else do you feel is really good to support a good, healthy gut? So number one, we want to try to avoid antibiotics, which I know are not is not impossible, um, which is not always possible, I should say. Um, especially here in Connecticut, we are in Lyme country and Antibiotics are necessary to get rid of chronic illnesses at, at times, um, but really we want to stop by, uh, killing off our good guys, and antibiotics are the first way you can do that. Um, we want to uh, definitely address food, and I think it's such a critical piece, especially whenever you're talking about young kids. It's hard. I get it. It's hard for us to change our own diets and our own lifestyle habits because that's our rituals. That's what we're used to, but... Um, especially a parent who's worn down and the kids don't want to choose to try the broccoli or whatever. And I, I get that that can be difficult, but it is an imperative piece that we teach young kids to start to explore things and maybe create, maybe teach them to cook or teach them to, ha you know, enjoy food prep, um, you know, make it fun so that we actually eat these vegetables because it is very important that we eat fiber to keep that digestive ecosystem happy. Um, it's, kind of amazing how we can really eat a very calorie dense diet and avoid a lot of fiber. Mm. Um, so it's, it's almost, it's almost hard to, but I mean, if you're a pasta lover and you're just eating, you know, mac and cheese and pizza and cereal all day, then you don't get as much uh, fiber that the plants can offer you. Um, and, um, hydrating, of course, making sure we're drinking plenty of water. That is essential for clearing uh, toxins from our body and helping our body find balance. Um, sleep is a very important uh, piece to our microbiome. So as with anything, um, if we're not sleeping, we're not restoring. And so um, our digestive tract does take a break at night. I mean, we fast at night. So that's time for it to restore as well, um, which is why it's it is important not to eat a giant meal before bed because mm -hmm. um, your body's not going to have time to really focus on breaking down that nu nutrient. Um, it's going to be focusing on trying to rest and relax um, and stress managing. I mean, really, and, 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 and by doing all these other things, eating well, hydrating, sleeping, you're usually going to be helping your stress level. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, finding a hobby that's going to be relaxing or exercising, which is always, of course, good for the digestive system um, to help make sure that you're eliminating regularly. Um, so I guess that is kind of the bottom line. You want to have enough fiber, water, um, restoration time for the gut and movement so that you actually do have regular bowel movements, which is you know, not everybody's favorite topic to talk about or to acknowledge whenever they come into the office, but we do spend a lot of time talking about frequency, texture, urgency, quality, like all of those things tell me something about what may be, may be missing in, in their diet or in their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I've had a lot of experience in the naturopathic world, in the holistic world, and we don't realize how important elimination is and how we're eliminating. And people who make the mark, so to speak, tend to feel healthier than those folks that have that are not on the mark, one way or the other, either too much diarrhea, too much constipation, etc. I taught for a number of years at a local university, and I did holistic health classes, and I was amazed at how little fiber some of the students get. And one of the things I had them do was pick one common dish from a fast food restaurant, broke them up into five groups. We did five fast food restaurants, and they had to look at the calories, the salt, the fat, the sugar, the fiber, as well as the number of ingredients it takes to make that dish. And they were absolutely amazed. Their eyes really opened at what's missing. You know, uh, some of these fast foods have a hundred different ingredients in that particular dish, as well as high fat, high salt, 
uh, all made with processed goods, processed ingredients, and no fiber to speak of, you know. So I think these are really good tips. And again, from my own experience, I, I saw a lot of that with the students. You know, and I understand it. They're busy. They grab a fast food meal. And I'm sure you see that in your a population that comes to you, you know. Fast food makes it easy for us to get grab on the go. Yeah, I'm, there's it's a lot of education and I think um, giving people resources is what's helpful and it's only fair because I don't like to just take things away I like to add things in so you know I might be saying like you know you're getting a lot of dairy in your diet you're telling me you're gassy and bloaty a lot sounds like that might not be working well for us we could do a lot of fancy schmas like schmancy testing or we could just eliminate it and see how you feel and then you know and even like with kids too, and the parents will be like, but I love dairy. So how would I, how could I cut that out of their diet? I, I love cheese. I love ice cream. And I'm like, I bet that you do, you know, and I'm sure that, you know, and it, that that's, you know, part of why your child is loving it so much too. But we, let's find some alternatives. So let's not think about cutting something out. Here's the list of all the different dairy free options that you could just replace so that you can see if that makes a difference. So I think framing it in a way that, first of all, educates them. That's an ingenious idea to be like, there's no fiber in this. What's the nutritional value? Like, and what all chemical, like, this is just a chemical burger that you're eating. So obviously, like, when they see that, it's going to, they're, they're going to think about that before they make that next decision. So educating and giving a lot of alternatives and options, I think, is, is the way that help people kind of nudge them in the right direction. I agree. Do you have any specific recommendations going into the holiday season based on our discussion? I mean, you gave us some good thoughts right now in terms of high fiber, hydration, sleep, and maybe exercising, but do you have any other food suggestions that might be really helpful for the holidays? Like, what could we do instead of uh, I know sweet potatoes and marshmallows go together at Thanksgiving. Do you have any other types of suggestions for folks? You know what I love to do, even personally, is I will look on Pinterest or on Google or whatever um, and look for paleo recipes. Because most of the time, paleo recipes, uh, although maybe, even if somebody can allow themselves to have grains, are going to have higher protein content. So they're going to use things like almond flours and nut flours, things that are going to have higher protein and usually have less sugar in them. So And still just as delicious. So um, one of my favorite things to make are some uh, something called cashew date bars. It's basically like making your own Lara bar, but without any extra ingredients. So you just mix some cashews, um, equal parts cashews, uh, pitted dates, and um, coconut flake with a little bit of vanilla and a little bit of salt, and um, into a, a food processor. And then you press it out into a pan and put it in the uh, fridge, and you cut it into little bites. And I can't tell you how many times people are like, I need to know the recipe. This seems so difficult. And when I tell them how simple it was, I'm like. This, I just got this off of some paleo website, mm -hmm. and it's delicious. You know, so, I mean, you do think of sweets this time of year, and so not totally not being able to indulge in any, but maybe picking things that are going to be higher fiber. Like, that's going to have boatloads of fiber between the uh, coconut flake and the and the date um, and have more nutritional value than just eating, you know, a sugar cookie. So, and I get it. It's tradition, and you want to decorate them, and that's fine, but then having other things that you can choose that are going to be healthier. Um, yeah, and, and that's a great suggestion because uh, some of my listeners are sensitive, and they are following either a paleo or a vegan, whatever, and that's a great recipe for them to offer to bring so that yeah. they have a choice, but then it opens up the door for everybody else in the family to try something that perhaps they wouldn't try. So thank you for that. That's a great that's a great suggestion. Yeah. It's it is it is hard to whenever you know like, you know, grandma's gonna have her Christmas ham or whatever. Like they're gonna have their setup of everything that they're gonna have, but you know, it doesn't mean you have to abstain just you know make let the host know that you're going to maybe bring some extra things not in a you know not because you don't like what they make but that you're you know are trying to restrict certain things and people most of the time are very open to that and they're like great I don't have to make dessert I would love for you to bring mm -hmm. whatever you know mm -hmm. so it is weird at first but just being your own advocate and saying I'd love to bring the pumpkin pie I want to make sure there's whatever no dairy in it or um, organic pumpkin and then you can still enjoy and everybody else can too.
Mm, yeah, that's great. I really like that. Well, before we leave, do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share before we go into your contact information? Yeah, so we talked about all the basics, the sleep, hydrating, you know, making sure we're still getting physical movement and trying to de-stress. Those are kind of like the foundations of naturopathic medicine, so I always like to make those um, reiterated. But um, something that you can ask your doctor to check you for is vitamin D levels. So especially here in New England, we live so far away from the equator um, that it, we just are not going to get the type of vitamin D or sun exposure that would allow us to make vitamin D as we would if we lived closer to the equator. So um, there are studies showing that low vitamin D levels increase your risk of flu, viral infections, um, and also depression, seasonal affective disorder in the winter. So if you can simply have your vitamin D levels tested and then um, supplement appropriately, um, that can really make a big difference in your immune system and also just how you feel. Um, it is a fat-soluble vitamin, so you can safely take smaller doses, probably just outright, but you do kind of want to know where you stand because you might be taking a pretty good dose and it might not be enough for you or it might be way too much for you. So having that tested, it's a quick, easy test, and most doctors will order that. Mm, great, thank you. Because yeah. we are we are in, in the midst of fall, winter's coming, the light is changing, and we don't get that uh, those rays that help our vitamin D level here in New England. Do you recommend a tanning bed that has the vitamin uh, D producing lights? Well, I don't usually recommend like tanning beds just for the UV radiation and the um, damage to the uh, melanocytes in the skin, but um, there is truth to, I don't know so much about vitamin D production, but they do have those uh, seasonal affective sun lamps that they sell. You know, you can get them on discount at Bed Bath & Beyond. You can buy them on Amazon. And there is, like, if you wake up in the morning and turn that puppy on, um, especially here soon when we're going to be doing daylight savings, switching around, that can really, like, it mimics, like, the sunlight. So it also kind of helps reduce um, uh, stress and also boost your cortisol so you have a little bit more energy. Mm -hmm. Um but unfortunately, vitamin D sources naturally are from the sun or fat-soluble sources like animals that have also been in the sun. So if you're eating, you know, beef that was raised in a barn that hasn't been exposed to sun, they're going to be devoid of vitamin D. And you could eat loads and loads of animal meats and maybe still not get enough. So, And that's not my recommendation to, to do that. So um, usually we have to supplement for vitamin D in order to get plenty of it. Mm, great. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that as well. Before we go, how about leaving us with your contact information? Yeah, so um, you can contact us um, through our website at ctnaturalhealth.com. Um, there's a contact us link there, or you can see all of the bios of all of our practitioners, and you'll find me on there as well. Um, our uh, office, main office is located in Manchester, Connecticut, but we also just recently opened up two satellite locations, um, one in West Hartford and one in Stonington. So um, we're kind of, we're trying to become more accessible for patients across Connecticut. So um, that's, that's us, and I uh, encourage you to check out our website. We do have a blog um, on our website where we try to in incorporate basically what we're talking about now, lifestyle things that you can switch up. Um, seasonal foods, that kind of thing, so you can find some information on there. Mm. You're a great resource, that's for sure. We're lucky here in this neck of the woods to have you folks. Thank you. <laughs> well, I want to thank you again for participating in the holistic nature of us. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm inspired. You gave very practical advice, and you also clarified a couple of issues that I think will be really relevant for the holiday season. So thank you again, and thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much, Judith. I really appreciate it. This is Judith Dreyer. I'm the author of At the Garden's Gate book and blog. My book is available through my website, which is www.judithdreyer.com, as well as several distribution arms, such as Amazon, Nook, Goodreads, and more. I'd like to remind all of you that a transcript is available for each podcast. We'll have the recipe included and the contact information. Please like and share the podcast. Let's support each other and get the word out. Remember, now is the time for practical action and profound inner change so we value our world again. Enjoy your day.